Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Pfizer Global. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global. Hi there. I am really happy to welcome you uh, in this activity. We're going to address today the topic of COVID-19 bivalent mRNA vaccines covering variants is a transition to endemicity. I'm Dr. Karine Lacombe, infectious disease specialist, professor of medicine at Sorbonne University in Paris, and I will be um, co-moderating this session with Andy. So please, Andy. Great. Well, thank you, Karine. I'm looking forward to it. I'm Andy Ustinoski. I'm an infectious disease physician in Manchester in the UK. So a pleasure to be with you. Um, so here is the agenda. In this uh, program, we will discuss the following points, Omicron and to variant virology and immunology, the current need for bivalent mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. And we're going to show you some key clinical data on bivalent mRNA COVID-19 vaccines including efficacy, immunogenicity, safety, and individual and public health benefits. So we will start by looking at Omicron and the immune evasion of new Omicron variants. To set up the scene, I would like to um, share with you the latest epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus and its changes. As you can see on this slide from the GISA data very, very recently, um, extracted from the database, you see that from February 2021 to uh, December 2021, we had um, the alpha, delta, beta, and gamma variants, but the change were quite slow. And all of a sudden, when we got the new um, variant called Omicron, the, the epidemiology changes was, was very, very quick. And we changed from BA1 to BA2, BA4, and BA5 within a time frame of six months. The Omicron variant has shown a super transmissibility, and it has very rapidly replaced the Delta variant as the dominant endemic variant in many countries. You see from this timeline that we switched from BA1 to BA2 until BA5 uh, within a frame of four to five months with a lot of subvariants. And by May uh, 23 of this year, we had over 3 million Omicron sequences uh, submitted to the GISA database. And um, many, many were even divided into more than 100 sub-lineages. And these lineages uh, also exhibit uh, very different capabilities of transmission and immune evasion. The prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 Omicron subvariants uh, are a little bit different from a continent to the other. Globally, you see that the BA2 has rapidly uh, be become dominant over the world, um, especially in the United Kingdom. But you see, for example, that in South Africa, uh, which has been uh, quite uh, often um, in the outpost of the, the emergence of variants, uh, BA4 and BA5 have become predominant quite early in the year, in April. And right now, in the continent, uh, in, in the continental Europe, like France, Germany, and other countries, BA4 and BA5 are uh, the predominant strains. So how did that uh, can be explained uh, with um, a electronic microscopy. If we look at the spike protein substitution in SARS-CoV-2 various variants, you see on these slides how we have gone from the Delta uh, spike to uh, the Omicron spike. 
in the Delta spike, um, a few, there were a few uh, mutations, which can also be seen in the Omicron variant, but with a lot more um, mutations than in the Delta. Uh, many of the mutations within the spike region of Omicron have been previously observed in other variants. For example, the deletion from 6930 was found in alpha. Uh, the T95I was also present in kappa and yotta. And uh, the G142D was present in kappa and delta. So the, the Omicron uh, is harboring a lot of mutations which confer uh, its possibility of immune evasion and immune escape. And it also explains the high transmissibility of the new Omicron variants. Um, we know that, for example, the BA4, BA5, or, BA, uh, or sub, subvariants BA2, uh, 13, 1 exhibit higher transmissibility than the BA2 lineage. And uh, the same um, variants and subvariants uh, display an increased evasion of uh, neutralizing antibodies compared to BA2 against plasma uh, from triple vaccinated individuals or even individuals who have exhibited um, um, a, a protection after BA1 infection. Unfortunately, those neutralizing uh, antibodies, either conferred by vaccination or by native infection, um, are evaded quite widely by the new strains, BA2, BA4, or BA5. And they, and they react very weakly uh, to pre-Omicron variants. And um, those Omicron uh, strains might, evolve, might have more mutations to evade the humoral immunity elicited by uh, the older um, BA1 uh, infections, for example. That's why um, there is a possibility that BA1 derived vaccine boosters may not achieve what we would like them to, to confer, which is a broad uh, spectrum protection against the new uh, Omicron uh, variant. What you see here, uh, the Omicron BA4 and BA5 uh, mutation, they, they lead to a reduced neutralization by SERA uh, from triple vaccinated individuals. And um, also the activity of SARS-CoV-2 therapeutic antibodies, so monoclonal antibodies are reduced again BA4 and BA5. We've got very new data regarding uh, the, the, the marketed um, monoclonal antibodies that are sub-effective or even ineffective against BA4 and BA5, which is a source of concern for hospitalized patients and especially the immunocompromised patients. Um, BA4 and BA5 have shown a degree of immune escape from the vaccine response, as I already told you. And these reductions in neutralization titles may reduce the effectiveness of the vaccine of preventing infections. Even if until now, uh, we have not seen um, any decrease in the protection against the severe disease. So there's a um, um, decrease in the protection against infection, but so far no real decrease against protection um, for protection against severe disease. And this is uh, strengthened by these uh, results shown here, where um, we see that there is a stronger immune escape with BA4, 5, and this subvariant called BA2, 12, 1, Omicron than what we saw with BA1 or BA2. And I uh, would like to uh, turn to Andrew to talk uh, to, to tell us about the effectiveness and direction of protection against Omicron lineage with the, the emerging variants. Thank you so much, Corinne. Um, yes, I'll just make a comment to begin with actually about the data that we look at when we're looking at different vaccine responses and different protections. Um, largely now it's uh, in vitro data for obvious reasons. It's very hard to get clinical data. You need very large studies. And we do see data on things like neutralizing antibodies um, levels, etc., um, and pseudovirus assays. Now, 
I think these are really important and really useful, particularly for determining that there may be an impact in protection against a new variant. But I would caution people not to use the absolute values of drop offs seen in things like pseudovirus assays and then translate that to a clinical scenario. I don't think they're as robust in that regard as, as would be optimal. So I think they're good at highlighting an issue, but we still need to have other data, clinical data and other data to support the real impact of a new variant on vaccine protection. The, the other thing about neutralizing antibody assays and pseudovirus assays is really they're just looking at one arm of our immune response. They're looking at the ability to neutralize free virus. But the antibodies themselves have other activity. They activate the cellular immune system. They activate complement in antiviral mechanisms. But also the vaccines that we use do also prime T cells. And T cell responses, I think, are going to be increasingly of interest over time. And that might be partly why the protection against hospitalization and severe disease persists longer than the antibody response. Um, but here we have a slide looking at um, uh, clinical efficacy. Um, this is uh, data from the UK, but there's similar data from elsewhere in the world. And in the graphics on the right hand side, the, the slide on the left is after two doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, deployed vaccine. And the two uh, dots that you've got there, the darker dot is Delta variant and Omicron is the, is the lighter dot. And I hope what you can see in terms of um, the vaccine effectiveness is that Omicron uh, does seem to impact on the vaccine effectiveness, but also that vaccine effectiveness wanes more quickly. Now, if we then look at boosting beyond the two doses, in the middle panel, boosting with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, um, you can see that the titers are improved and persist for perhaps a little bit longer, but again, drop off more quickly with Omicron. And the same is seen if we boost with the other major mRNA vaccine, the Moderna vaccine on the panel on the right. So we do see clinical effectiveness also impacted rather than just the in vitro data that we've been speaking about. But let me pass back to Karine now about the vaccine schedule in France. So over to you, Karine. Yes, exactly. So where do we stand with uh, scheduling vaccines around Europe? And here is the example of what we do in France. Uh, vaccine is recommended to um, everybody in the population. It's compulsory for health workers and it's compulsory for people working with uh, very uh, with uh, elderly people. So for example, in children from five to 11, we recommend two doses uh, with three weeks apart. For children above 11 and adults, two doses, three weeks apart and one booster, three months after the second injection. And we also recommend a third uh, a, a second booster in a uh, special population like adults over 60, adults living in nursing homes, all adults with risk factors for severe COVID-19, regardless of age, pregnant women, individuals living with any of the subject uh, above uh, categories. And we also recommend a third booster, uh, a third dose, sorry, and two boosters in immunosuppressed individuals um, before going to um, protection with monoclonal antibodies. Um, I have to highlight the fact that an acute COVID-19 should account for one injection. How is it in the UK? Is it different from what we recommend in France, Andy? Yeah, there are differences. And I think probably every single country has differences. So there's differences in the population. Um, but also in some of the factors, for instance, we don't necessarily account acute COVID-19 as equivalent to an injection, though I can see the logic behind it. So we've already given second boosters to our immunocompromised individuals earlier on this year. From September onwards in 2022, we are offering vaccines uh, to a broader population. Um, this is second boosters. That will be adults over the age of 50, anybody immunocompromised, so similar to your setting. Anybody in a nursing home or care setting and anybody who works in a nursing home or care setting, household contacts of people who are immunocompromised, etc. So there are some similarities, some differences. If we go back to the priming regimen in the UK for largely pragmatic reasons, we actually had an interval beyond three weeks between the first two doses, um, up to three months. 
um, which was initially, as I say, for pragmatic reasons, we could vaccinate more people in a short period of time, but actually there's now data to support that's a reasonable thing to do. So there are differences between different countries. Okay, so now that we have set up the scene for um, talking about the bivalent mRNA, uh, COVID-19 vaccine, uh, let's move into the emerging uh, immunogenicity data for those vaccines. So um, maybe we can uh, have a little chat about the need for uh, bivalent vaccines. Um, as we have told you until now, we have used monovalent vaccines and fortunately uh, access, uh, rapid access to vaccine have um, led to the aversion of about 20 million deaths globally as reported in a very nice uh, study published recently in the Lancet Infectious Disease. However, um, I think that the emergence of Omicron strains um, have to lead us to change the paradigm of vaccine because we have seen that those new variants can evade immunity from either prior infections or vaccine and even if they still confer uh, protection against death and hospitalization we see that there is a very limited protection against symptomatic disease and um when i say that we have to change the paradigm is to uh, is it's based on the fact that uh, multivalent vaccines, for example, have been frequently used in other infectious diseases such as papillomavirus, influenza, where the, the, the composition of the vaccines change every year, pneumococcus, which is a bacterial infection, et cetera, et cetera. So Andy, can, could we postulate that uh, the protection may be broader and stronger uh, if we use bivalent or even multivalent vaccines one day, including historical strains, for example, Omicron and the coming you know, future variants? Yeah, no, absolutely, Karine. I think you know, we've, had, we've been very fortunate with the efficacy of the vaccines that were first developed and have been deployed so far. Uh, they outperformed um, my expectations, and as you say, they've saved countless numbers of lives around the world. They still have activity against Omicron, but there's room for improvement, and we should always look to see if we can improve things. So, if they're not working against some of the strains of Omicron as well as we would hope and as well as they do against the other strains, what could we do? We could develop vaccines against the new strains, and that's partly what we're talking about here, Omicron-specific strains. Um, and you could roll that out. I think there is a, a potential difficulty with that in terms of by the time we've developed such vaccines and rolled them out, maybe we're beyond Omicron. Maybe we're what, whatever letter comes next in the Greek alphabet, and I don't know my Greek alphabet well enough. Um, okay, Andy, I, I, I still have a question um, about the fact that we have chosen to include in the bivalent vaccine the original historical strain and Omicron strain and not, for example, Delta or Beta and Omicron. So why the historical strain? Well, that's a really good question, and I guess we'll only know whether it's the right thing to do in the future when we look backwards. But there is logic behind it. So a lot of infections, new strains evolve from the most recent other strain, whether that's influenza or multi resistant bacteria or a whole variety of different areas. But it seems to be a little bit different at the moment with COVID-19. So if we look at one of those phylogenetic trees that people make uh, looking at new strains, for a lot of infections like influenza, you have a new strain and then the next new strain probably evolves from that. So you have a branching um, pattern that goes off into the distance. Now, so far for COVID-19, what we've seen really is that the new strains seem to adapt or develop from the wild type or from a very early strain. In other words, you've got your center dot, which is where your wild type is, and alpha came out, and beta came out, and delta came out, and Omicron's come out. It's since then had BA1, BA2, BA4, BA5, et cetera, coming from it. But the next strain of concern, we obviously don't know what it is, but if it follows the same pattern, it might well be coming from the original wild type strain or a very early strain. And so if we switched everything to being Omicron focused, but the next strain is more similar to the prototype um, strain, the wild type strain, which is what we've seen so far with the new variants of concern, then we won't be doing ourselves many favors. So that's why, at least at the moment, I favor prototype strain, 
with an adapted strain like Omicron BA1 or BA4, BA5. Let's see what the future tells us. Now, I completely agree with you that we should stick uh, in the next vaccine, multivalent vaccines, to the original historical strain, uh, which has triggered a very high morbidity uh, and, um, and of course, adapting to the new, uh, to the new variants. Maybe we can uh, share and discuss the clinical immunogenicity data we have now with the next uh, vaccine, the bivalent vaccine? Great, absolutely, very happy to. So here we've really got um, the two different vaccine preparations where we've got emerging data at the moment. There are other combinations that are beginning to be worked on, but there's the Moderna combination, which is the prototype or wild type vaccine that we've used in deployment, um, combined with an Omicron BA1 sublineage vaccine, and similar from Pfizer, the prototype and a BA1 sublineage. If we start with the Moderna bivalent vaccine, you can see the preliminary clinical findings here on the right. There does seem to be superior Omicron neutralizing antibody responses compared to the standard vaccine, uh, and the neutralizing antibody responses against the previous strains when tested in, viva, in vitro um, seem to be similar. If we actually drill down into the data, on this slide, there's a lot of figures, so don't worry, I'm not going to go through them. Um, but what I'd like to point out is on the left, um, against an ancestral strains of SARS-CoV-2, a lot of the numbers are fairly similar between the bivalent vaccine, which is recorded here as 1273.214, and the original deployed vaccine, the 1273. So the ratios of geometric means of titers, et cetera, are not very dissimilar. But if you look at the panel on the right, when the in vitro testing is done against Omicron, hopefully you can see that the jump up in the neutralizing antibody titers does seem to be significantly more with the bivalent vaccine again, rather than just the original vaccine strain. So jumping from titers of just under 300 to 2,372 versus uh, around 330, going up to just 1,473 with the original uh, vaccine. So I think there is some data um, to support the concept of improving that potential defect in control against Omicron. If we look at the data graphically, it's probably easier. So here's some of that data. Uh, if we look at the panel on the left, all participants, you can see that pre-booster and then day 29 post-booster, the lighter color being the original um, Moderna vaccine, which has been deployed, and the darker blue being the bivalent vaccine with the BA1 component, you can see that the increment is actually very similar. And that's also true whether you divide by no prior infection in the middle panel or prior infection on the right panel. The increment is similar between the two vaccine preparations against the ancestral SARS-CoV-2. Obviously, if you've had prior infection, as you alluded to, um, in France, where you consider it as equivalent of having a vaccine, you start with higher titers to begin with. And so that's the difference we see there. But that's against the ancestral, the previous strains. What about against Omicron? Well, here we've got the data. Now, it is a logarithmic graph, so perhaps the differences aren't always as easy to see visually. But if we look at all participants, the actual incremental increase in neutralizing antibodies is greater for the bivalent vaccine that includes BA1 uh, versus um, the original vaccine. And that is equally true for whether you've had prior infection or no prior infection. So this is really that, that numerical data put in graphical form. What about safety though? Because that's obviously really important as well. Well, here we've got some early data coming through about the Moderna bivalent. Now, it looks like a complicated graphic, but each of the pairings we've got here, the top line is the original deployed Moderna vaccine, and the line beneath it is the bivalent vaccine. And I hope you can see graphically that there's very little difference. The total dose of mRNA in the vaccines is the same, 50 micrograms. And so this, to me, uh, implies that any adverse events, any side effects, are really related more to the dosing of the mRNA rather than the composition of the mRNA. We do see the local reactogenicity that we expect with pain and maybe some swelling or tenderness and some systemic reactogenicity, particularly with headaches, fatigue, myalgias, uh, chills, et cetera, which is what we've got used to seeing. 
but really is not beyond what we would normally expect. And the vast majority are grade one or grade two. So let's have a think about the Pfizer, because we've got some emerging data about the Pfizer bivalent, again with the BA1 sublineage. And the, the text on the right shows that, again, superior Omicron neutralizing antibody responses have been elicited. So let's drill down into the data. So this is not the bivalent. This is the original um, uh, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And just to reaffirm that if we look at the responsiveness after the two initial doses uh, against the different strains, you can see that perhaps beta was slightly less responsive, but overall good responses against all the strains up until we've had Omicron and the Omicron BA1 spike, where you can see that the neutralizing titers were significantly diminished. Now that's after the two initial doses. What about if we give a booster? Well, here we've got a graphic on the left of the responses, the neutralizing antibodies responses against wild type virus. And you can see that after week two, data we've just more or less shown on the previous graphic, there's good protection. But by the time people are due their third dose, their booster dose, it's dropped down, but we get a good incremental response one month and four months after the booster dose for the wild type virus. If we look at the same on the right hand panel with the Omicron, you can see that after the two doses, very poor responses, but there is a significant boost after a booster, after the third dose, which will, rely, which will produce some protection, but it isn't to the same degree as the wild type and perhaps doesn't have the longevity of the wild type response. What about even further doses? So here we've got again some emerging data that's beginning to come through. Um, this particular slide is looking at adults under the age of 55. And they were given as a booster, either um, the original Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine or an Omicron monovalent vaccine. So not bivalent at the moment, but really comparing the original against one designed against the Omicron. Now, the bottom row here is, a, is the titers against the ancestral strain. And I think you can hopefully see that there's really no difference. So the, the Omicron did seem to have the same neutralizing um, impact against the ancestral strains. But if we look at the middle row against Omicron BA1, you can see, I hope, that numerically we get a better titer of neutralizing antibodies with the Omicron design vaccine, which is not surprising because it's been designed to be a BA1 vaccine. And if we look at this next graphic, which is actually looking at older adults over 55, and here, slightly different, they could have the original Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, the monovalent, they could have the one we were just talking about, monovalent BA1 Omicron, or they could have the combined bivalent vaccine. Um, these latter two examined at two different doses. Now, what I would suggest is looking at the bottom row, which is the the geometric mean titer ratio compared to the original deployed vaccine. We can see a significant incremental increase in titers against BA1 Omicron by having the BA1 Omicron monovalent or by having the BA1 bivalent uh, vaccine um, shown really with a doubling or almost tripling in some cases, depending on dosage of the titers. So to me, the results of these studies do indicate that we can get better responses, at least neutralizing antibody responses, against Omicron by including an Omicron design factor. Uh, and I think that was our hypothesis as we started. The two that I've mentioned here are designed against the BA1 Omicron strain. There's early um, preclinical and animal data implying that we should get good immunogenicity against the BA4, BA5 strains, and those are beginning to enter into human studies now. So in other words, we may be, the next data that we get, or the big data we get, may include a wild type prototype strain mixed with a, a vaccine specifically against the BA4, BA5. Let me just talk a little bit about some of the limitations of these bivalent studies that I've just shown. So um, we've only really looked at uh, a limited number of vaccine formulations, and there are plenty of other combinations possible, and a limiting number of dosing combinations as well. Only neutralizing antibodies being measured. 
And as I alluded to earlier on, there are other ways the vaccines work through the cellular immune response or antibody related immune responses, coordinating your complement pathway or your cellular response itself. We have limited data on using these new vaccines earlier on in the vaccination pipeline. The studies have really been used as boosters in those who already had priming vaccines. And as I've just alluded to, these particular bits of data I've shown have been with a bivalent designed against the BA1. And I think what will be very interesting is when we have bivalence or indeed multivalence against other Omicron and other sublineages. And we don't know the durability as yet of this neutralizing antibody responses because we haven't had them for long enough. But I'd be waiting for that data to come through. Yeah. So um, finally, uh, we could maybe discuss the consideration for future COVID-19 vaccines. And um, of course, you have seen from the previous uh, three years that if you are slowly going out of uh, the pandemic, even if we will have to live uh, with the virus, uh, we have seen that the vaccine has been an essential tool to prevent death and hospital admissions of course, alongside with uh, uh, combined preventions during the epidemic waves. Uh, and um, unfortunately, we have experienced progressive waning immunity that has led to advocate for boosters and now uh, for new uh, compositions of vaccine like bivalent and maybe in the near future, multivalent um, vaccines. So um, it has come from the fact that we have seen the emergence of a highly transmissible strains like Omicron that can easily evade uh, post-infection and post-vaccine efficacy. Um, I've introduced the term change of paradigm uh, with a switch from monovalent to bivalent and maybe one day uh, multivalent vaccines. We think, um, as Andy told you, that the best way to do that will be to keep uh, the original strain and add uh, other um, valence inside the, inside the vaccine, like for now B1 as it is designed by uh, the industry, and maybe later with other, uh, other strains. So what, how do you see that? Uh, do you think that we will um, have to change the composition of vaccines every year as we do with the flu, for example? Do you think that it will be combined with other uh, vaccines against other viruses? What's your opinion on that, Andy? A, a very good question. And I think, you know, it'll be easy in retrospect in five years time to say what's the best thing. At the moment, we have to guess somewhat. So I think there are several things I'd like to say. First off, um, we are talking about improving vaccination responses, at least based on the in vitro data. Um, if a setting doesn't have access to bivalent vaccines, carry on with the monovalent vaccines. I provided some data saying that actually, if you carry on boosting, you do get better immune responses against Omicron and potentially newer strains that come through. So don't delay having a vaccine because you're waiting for the next ones to come around the corner that maybe look better in vitro. I think get the boosters when you're offered them. And then in the future, when we have better boosters, you can get those as well. Now, if we think about the future, I think to me, there are two aspects. One is uh, how do we protect against future strains that are gonna come, come through? And the other one is, well, is there a way that we can get longer lived immunity? So we're not having boosters every six months or every year from now on. And what are the best routes for doing that? Well, I do think that the logic behind bivalent or multivalent vaccines may help protect against the new variants coming through. For reasons that I alluded to earlier on, I think still having the prototype strain there to begin with is logical because the new evolved strains that we don't yet know what they are may well evolve from those strains rather than from Omicron itself. So I think having that bivalent is logical. In terms of longer lasting immune responses, well, I think we've become a lot more interested over the last few months or last year or so in T cell responses. I think what might be protecting us from hospitalizations and death is partly our T cell responses to these vaccines. Could we optimize those T cell responses? And T cell responses may well last a lot longer than the serology, the antibody responses. So I think bivalent, multivalent, 
perhaps focusing a little bit more or tailoring to encourage those T cell responses may be the routes forward because COVID-19 is not going away. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I think that uh, some of the key messages um, to keep from this um, activity today is that uh, everybody should get vaccinated first, and then uh, we should promote vaccination. We should promote research um, in uh, vaccine strategies, because in the future, uh, we will have to adapt to uh, the new variants and the way the epidemic will evolve in. Uh, of course, not forget the combined prevention, even if vaccination is the cornerstone of the fight against COVID-19, it, it has really changed and the face of the epidemic. It's not only vaccine that uh, will uh, prevent um, uh, next pandemic, but also uh, combine uh, protection. Um, uh, maybe a few last words before we wrap up this activity, Andy? Yes, well, I mean, I, I alluded to it earlier on, but I think we've been very fortunate with the vaccines that we've had so far. They've worked really well. They've saved countless lives. They still work against even the Omicron strains we're talking about, but there is room for improvement. Scientifically and logistically, we should carry on working at trying to improve things as much as possible. I think bivalent vaccines are the logical next step and are beginning to be adopted around the world in the deployed vaccine programs. But in the future, perhaps other bivalents, multivalents, T-cell focus, I think we're, we've got a long way still to go. We've come a long way, but we've got a long way still to go. Yeah, definitely. So thank you, Andy. It was a real pleasure uh, to share this session with you. Uh, and I would like to thank you for participating in this activity. Please take a moment to complete the program evaluation and receive credit. Thank you and have a good day. This program was presented by Medscape Education Global.